Matthew 5, 38 says this. You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay, here's what I want you to do. If you can, uh, grab your bulletin or a piece of paper or an envelope in the pew or something, and uh, something to write with. And I want you to, I mean, I know your bulletin doesn't have tons of open space, but there's some margins. I just want you to write a list of your enemies, okay? And this could be, you know, this might be, uh, you know, somebody at work by name. It might be a general people group like Denver Broncos. Like that would be an understandable (laughs) enemy. But like, I want you to write a couple, like three of them. Write them down. You're not going to turn this in. You're not going to give this to anybody. Don't worry. I'm not going to not going to look at it. I just want you to do it. So so think about who is my enemy? Who is a problem for me? And then I want you to think about why you would put them down. Three of your enemies on the piece of paper. Now, the next thing I want you to do is find another small piece, uh, a small area you can write in. And I want you to answer, who is my tribe? Who are my people? Okay, what is my group? And again, write down three of them if you can. Who is it that I belong to that I say, this is my group of people? And as you do that, I just want to talk about this for a second. You see, when Jesus talked to the, the people in the first century and he talked to them about enemies, about people who do bad things to you and and those who hate you and all these kinds of things. They were living in a world with real enemies. Uh, The Jewish people had enemies. When he talked about enemies, I guarantee you, people flashed before their eyes. They hated Rome, who had taken over their country and and, um, did not allow them to do things the way they wanted to do them. They had all these people groups around them, these nations that they had spent generations fighting with, like the Philistines and the, and the Midianites, the Amalekites, the, all these groups of people that they have fought with time and time again for generations. They had people of their, of their own that, that were they considered traitors. In fact, Jesus even kind of talks about them when he talks about tax collectors who were Jewish people who were working for Rome. How dare you take money from your own people for the enemy and pocket some of it yourself? They had others that they looked down as as enemies. In in, uh, Stuart's reading, we hear about a Samaritan, a, uh, a descendant of a people group who intermixed with neighbors and, and again, were treated as less than to the Jews. They had enemies. So who are ours? When I think of that term, like I don't have a lot of like actual enemies in my life. Now, I mean, we can talk about sports rivalries, but those, that, those aren't real. You know, we don't actually hate those people. They just root for the wrong team, right? They're just on the wrong side. And, and so, you know, sometimes we think the refs are our enemies. But, but like we, we might have that, but it's not real. Maybe it's work enemies. Maybe there's somebody, a boss, a coworker, somebody that we really have trouble with at work. Maybe it's, and, and especially in this moment, political enemies. Those people on the other side. Those people that want to vote for the other person. 
that, that don't think the way I do about how to make things better in this country. Hopefully you don't have real enemies. Hopefully you don't have to worry about fear for your life and your safety because someone wants to harm you. We live in a pretty great place that for the most part, that's not happening for most of us. But where do our enemies come from? They come from putting ourselves in a tribe of some kind, our community. And when we hold on to a tribe, what happens is oftentimes we then see somebody else as the other. If I grab on to my local Kansas City teams, then all of their team's rivals become my rivals. And they become the enemy to me. Our tribes that we, uh, that we, that we hold on to, whether it's a sports team, a hobby group, a, a bunch of people that like to do the things that I like to do, or a political side, our tribes define our enemies. Well, we are in an ugly season in, in our country. We have an election coming up. It's particularly ugly the way that, that political people talk about and to each other in a way that I've certainly never seen this level in my lifetime. And it's going to get worse probably before it gets better, you know, and we can, we can look forward to post November and, and getting beyond all of the rhetoric and the signs and the stuff. But here's the thing. If you look around this group of people, I guarantee you that there are people around you in this room. There's probably people in your family. There's definitely people in your job, in your neighborhood, in your school that are going to vote for the other side than you. But this is our primary tribe. When God makes us, he makes us into families. And he says, this is how we're going to live and flourish is through those people that he puts in our lives. And when, when Jesus came, he invited us into this greater family where we call each other brother and sister because of our connection to Jesus. This is our tribe. So how do we get along in this more important community with brothers and sisters in Christ when we differ on some things? When we might hold on to one side or the other in the midst of a divided country during a divided election? How do we live as disciples of Jesus in this moment? How do we get connected to what's happening while remaining like him? We are called to represent Christ in everything we do. So we're starting this series today. We're calling it the campaign uh, because there are campaigns right now that are vying for your support, probably your money, definitely your votes, right? Like that's part of this process. Well, our campaign is something different. We are campaigning for kindness in the midst of the mess. So today I want to talk about kindness, about being kind, not nice. Now let me define that for you. What's the difference? I think really it comes down to sincerity. We can smile and be nice to people while holding our disdain for them. You've probably done that, whether it's at work or in your neighborhood, at Thanksgiving with your family. Like we can be nice and pretend that everything's okay. We can get along. We can make sure not to bring up any of the stuff that makes people mad. We can do all that, but it's not really real. Instead, we are called to kindness. Kindness is genuine. It's finding a way to love people truly, not just tolerate them or pretend to like, like them, but to love people regardless of if they fall into my tribe or if they believe what I believe about everything. Here's why kindness matters. Because God is kind. 
and he wants us to be like him towards each other. Psalm 145 says this, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Romans 2 says, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? God wants us to emulate his kindness. He is kind, compassionate, merciful. He is good to his creation. And so he desires for us to be the same to others. Matthew 12 says this. That time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. As Jesus and his disciples are, are passing through, they start picking food because they're hungry, but it's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to work, and picking food is work, and now you're breaking a law. And what Jesus says is, don't you understand that that's not the point? Another version says it this way. The scriptures say, I don't want animal sacrifices. I want you to show kindness to people. You don't really know what that means. If you understood it, you would not judge those who have done nothing wrong. We've said to our kids a million times, I don't want to hear you're sorry. I want you to stop doing the thing you're apologizing for, right? I, I'm not interested in your apology. I want you to do the thing we asked you to do. Jesus is the same way. I'm not interested in your animal sacrifices. I want your kindness, your compassion for others. God wants us to be kind in the way that we act. And Ephesians gives us a really great um, way to do so. Uh, as, as Paul's letter to the, the church in Ephesus gives us some instructions. If you want, you can turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17. How do we live as a people of kindness in the midst of an ugly moment? Ephesians 4, 17. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul says... Do not be like everybody else. Right now, again, we can get easily caught up in a, in a country and a moment where the other side is my enemy. And that's what everybody else is doing. We're insulting everyone else. If you're not going to vote with me, then you're the worst. We insult, we believe the worst about each other. We call names, we repeat lies, we demonize the other side. We, we say the worst possible things. That's what's going on every day on cable news channels and everywhere else. And Paul's response is, you, brothers and sisters, you don't be like them. We are not made to be like them. We cast aside that part of ourselves when we come to know Jesus and we do something different. This is not us. 
So he goes on in verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. This is how Christians act during a divided election. It starts with each other. How can we make this community a place of kindness, regardless of your political affiliation? Do you talk about political things? Sometimes we just say, hey, we're just not going to talk about that. We're going to pretend that all that's happening around us we're not going to deal with. Sometimes that's okay. Sometimes it's okay to ask actual questions of each other and, and talk through some of the issues that are at hand but how can we talk about it? Is it by condescending the other side? Is it, is it by creating straw man arguments about those that we disagree with? If you don't understand what a straw man argument is, if you were to build a man out of straw, straw how strong is he? Not very much. So what we often do is when we believe something, then we take whatever we think the other, the other side believes and we give the worst possible arguments for it. Well, they believe, and then we give it this um, kind of weak and sad argument and say, look how strong my argument is because theirs is so weak. Is that what we're doing when we talk about this stuff? Or instead, could we imagine that our brothers and sisters are also good, that they may also love their country, that they might also want what is best that maybe they're not stupid. Maybe they just see things differently than I do. I was listening uh, to a podcast where um, this lady was talking about her marriage, and she said, you know, one of the things that changed everything in my marriage, she said, my husband and I would fight, and I'd get mad at him about something he did. And she said, finally, this is what changed it. We sat down, and my husband said to me, you know that I love you. So when you get really upset with something I did, let's maybe start with the fact that I love you and am probably not trying to hurt you. And that's true. In our marriage, sometimes we do stuff that bothers the other one or hurts the other one. But we're, you know, in a loving, committed relationship, that's not the intention. So what if we imagined that our spouse wasn't trying to hurt us, but maybe just did something the wrong way. Could we do the same for the other side? Could we, instead of making straw man arguments, could we be a people who come up with steel man arguments to say, what, what is the best possible argument for the side that I disagree with? How could somebody who cares and who is good and who is kind, how could someone go to that side and believe what they believe and come up with the best way to understand it? Again, imagine they also are good, love their country, and what want, want what is best for this world that we live in. And then we need to think about how we engage with everyone else as well. What do we say? How do we say it? What do we post on social media? Does it look like Jesus? Does it have his tone? Does it give the benefit of the doubt to the people that might not be in agreement with me? Does it represent Christ in a loving way? Jesus never really cared about the politics of Rome. 
You know, when he was asked about political things, he, he typically um, kind of uh, showed them a different way. You may remember there's a story where they came up to, to Jesus and said, are we supposed to pay taxes? Because, you know, we have these coins, we're supposed to pay taxes to Rome. And Jesus says, well, pull out a coin. They pull it out and he says, whose image is on the coin? And on the coin is an image of Caesar. And he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And give to God what is God's. Now, we are blessed to be in a different situation than Jesus was in. We live in a country where we're a part of the system. We get to be involved through voting, through campaigning, through all the things. We're able to have influence on policy, on candidates, on representatives. All that stuff is good, and we are blessed to have those opportunities. Because we can try to work for the flourishing, the goodness of our neighbors through this process. You know, the, the first century Jews did not have that opportunity under Roman occupation. But while we should not ignore that, we should want to help to make things better for others. We also need to remember to give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. You know, that image on that coin was Caesar's image. But the image that's on you and me is God's. He has made you in his image. And what that means is we are his and our citizenship is first to his kingdom, not to this one. And as kingdom citizens, we have to live out his ways, even when we're involved in our national stuff. So I invite you today to be different than everybody else. That, this, that we can campaign for kindness in the midst of this election. We can show love to people, we can be humble, we can bring Jesus to this divided country by looking like him, even when we disagree with others. Let's pray. Lord, I praise you that you have invited us into uh, communion with you and into a family. And I, I thank you that, that uh, no matter what happens, no matter what happens in November, no matter what happens in the world around us, we don't have to fear. The world isn't going to end apart from your work, that you have things under control, that you have promised us uh, making all things new, bringing justice and goodness to the world, that you will reconcile all things when Jesus returns. So in this season, we don't have to be afraid but instead we can trust that you have things under control. Lord, as we, uh, as we do our best to represent you, to live as disciples of Jesus, we pray that you would give us the strength and the courage to do so, to act differently than everybody else in the way that we engage with political things, to be a people who lead with kindness, who think best of those we disagree with, who try to find a way forward in unity. Lord, I thank you uh, for what you've done for us. We pray that you would be with us as we try to follow you each day. In Jesus' name.